Welcome to The Healthy Advisor, a podcast from wealthmanagement.com focused on advisors' personal well-being and healing. I'm Diana Britton, Managing Editor of wealthmanagement.com, and in this podcast, we explore some of the struggles and personal development issues facing advisors and financial services professionals, and how to get to a place of healing for mind, body, and spirit. Hello and welcome to the latest podcast episode of The Healthy Advisor, and thanks for joining us. As you may know, this is the podcast focused on financial advisor health and well-being, and today's guest certainly has some great life lessons for us. His name is Joseph R. Biondo. Uh, He's the founder of Biondo Investment Advisors, an RA that he runs with his son, Joseph P. Biondo, in Milford, Pennsylvania. They manage just under a billion in uh, assets under management. And Joe, who's 83 years old and celebrating 60 years in the industry this year, um, has no plans of retiring anytime soon. Joe, thank you so much for being on the podcast and congrats on your 60th anniversary in the industry. That's uh, such a big milestone. Oh, thank you. And thanks for having me. So Joe, he he's had you know incredible success in his career, uh, long career as an advisor, uh, but you know Joe's experienced his ups and downs in his eighty three years, you know personally and professionally, and you know his life began with with a tragedy. Um, just three weeks before he was born, his father passed away, and leaving his mother a widow with uh, two boys, at I think the age of thirty in um, Canarsie, Brooklyn. Um, so, Joe, could you tell us a little bit about your childhood growing up in Brooklyn? Uh, you know, what was life like for your mother as a young widow? Well, obviously, as a child, I didn't realize how tough it was for her to have lost her husband and have a four-year-old and a newborn. Mm-hmm. Um, and she quickly uh, was in need of uh, funds and resources. And so she applied for uh, welfare assistance. And back then, the support was $26 per month per child. So Mm. she received $52 in welfare assistance and then had to go to work. And if you were working, you couldn't receive welfare. So she took the name of an alias, which was her grandmother's name, and went to work about a block from our home and uh, was sewing PT coats uh, for the Navy and the Second World War. So it was 1940, and she was making the equivalent of about $35 a week. So between that and the extra $52 a month, uh, she managed to uh, raise the two of us in a very modest fashion, obviously. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm trying to sort of do the inflation numbers in my head, but uh, I mean, you know, I know you had you didn't you grew up without a father, and I mean, how do you think that kind of affected you? You know, not having a father figure. Um, I mean, you know, my husband grew up without his father, and I guess he didn't really know any better, so it was just that was, you know, just the way things were. But um, you know, how did that sort of impact you? Well, I, I think. When I was in school and, you know, my classmates would talk about their parents and talk about their father, it left me feeling uh, on the outskirts of the conversation and realizing that I was missing something. But on the other hand, my mom was an extremely strong woman and um, did her very best to provide us with the uh, outlook of a mother and a father. So there were times Mm. that she would sit me down and say, this is your father talking. And I recall that very vividly because, Mm. uh, you know, the conversations would be different when she was everyday mom. And then not that frequently, but when she did it, it was, this is your dad talking. And it left an impression on me. And I think it, it really gave me ambition to want to succeed because she always made me feel like I would be responsible in her later years to provide for her. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, she sounds like a really strong, wonderful woman. Yeah. Um, what were some of the biggest lessons that you learned from her? The biggest things that you took away? Well, I think you know she only um, she only attended school until the eighth grade. She was one of nine children. Wow. And so they all had to leave and help the family. And her father died relatively young and left her mother with the nine children. So they all started to work and contribute. You know, that was a long time ago, obviously, but that's the way things were. And she, in her lifetime, probably read over 2,000 books. So she had a tremendous curiosity from everything that involved politics to finance to athletic events. It didn't matter. There Mm. was a curiosity about her that I think I inherited and I very much enjoy. So I love to find out about anything and everything and how it works and how it evolved and how it got to be where it is today from where it started. So that was, I think, one big lesson. And the other was to be self-reliant and be prepared in life. I mean, she had a motto of always be prepared. So I always looked at these opportunities that I've had as, can I live with the worst case scenario and the best case scenario will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. So when I've entered everything, it's always been, if things go wrong, how bad could it be? And if they go right, fine, I can live with whatever the upside is. But I wanted to make sure I understood the risk and the downside of things. Yeah, well, that's a great skill to have, right, as a financial advisor. Yeah, I think it's it's worked well for, for me and for the firm. Mm-hmm. So I know that you you guys, um, you know, you mentioned that you and your brother you know, sort of were involved in a gang fight and, and eventually led your mother to get out of Brooklyn what happened? What uh, tell so us we, about that? Yeah, so we were both young altar boys at the time, and in our teens, and we were at a church bazaar, and I forget the details, but I know that a fight r- broke out, and you know we were with a group of our friends, you know our our gang against the other gang, and my mom happened to be there working in one of the booths for the church at the bazaar. And when she saw that happen, uh, she decided that it would be uh, prudent to Mm -hmm. get us out of the environment of being in Brooklyn at the Mm -hmm. time. So she got in touch with her brother-in-law, who was up in the Port Jervis, New York area, right on the border of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York, and indicated that if he could find a home that was affordable, she would like to move. Mm, and so you guys did. And, yeah, um, we did. And how did you, um, you know, develop a passion for the markets and and eventually get into the industry? I know it's sort of a really interesting story. So when we moved to uh, this area in Pennsylvania uh, that I just described, I was uh, sixteen, and I spent one year in uh, high school. Met some, you know, the students there and classmates. And mm-hmm. then I went into service for six months as a six-month wonder. And then when I came back, I was working with my uncle in the construction business. And I met a friend by the name of Ed Metzger, uh, who was a classmate. And one night we're at a bar and he he asked me if I ever bought any stocks. And I said, no, I had no idea about anything. And he said, well, my mom loves to trade in real estate and securities. And she has a broker in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. And you ought to call him because she just bought a new stock called Armor Meats. And uh, and they were the warrants of Armor Meats. So the next day I called a gentleman by the name of Fred Titus. And I told him that I got his name from Mrs. Metzger's son. And I'd like to invest some money. And so he said, well, the price of the shares are $17. And I told him promptly that I would buy 10 shares. So my first venture was $170 in the market. And fortunately for me, Fred was uh, very astute. And he picked the stock that in a matter of a couple of months, or maybe even less, went from 17 to about $35. 
Mm. And he called me and said, you should sell it. And I have another stock for you to buy. So before you know it, Fred was telling me, sell this, buy that. And uh, for a period of time, I never understood that stocks could go down because Fred kept picking winners. Mm. And my $170 started to really grow. And in a matter of a few years, it was worth about $17,000. Mm. So wow. I, yeah, so I, I, uh, then this was now 1962. So it was about five years after I started, four years after I started trading with Fred. And I'm driving to New York one day and I thought, you know, I'd like to be in that business. So I, I turned around, went home, put on a suit and tie, drove to Stroudsburg, which was about 40 miles away and said, Fred, I'd like to have a job. And he said, you know, it's difficult and not easy. And uh, let me think about it. So I never mm -hmm. heard from him. A few mm -hmm. months later, I did the same thing. So the third time, which was probably six months from my original visit with him, I walked in and I said, look, Fred, I'll work for free. And he mm -hmm. said, uh, you're really serious about getting into the business. I said, well, I would like to get into the business. And my mom had always said to me, you know, if you deal in pennies, you make pennies. If you deal in millions, you make millions. And that left an impression in the stock market was, you know, dealing in rather large sums of money. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'll see if I can get you an interview. And he did uh, with a gentleman by the name of Leo Larkin. And so from the time Fred told me about the interview until I interviewed was probably three or so weeks and I read everything I could and studied about dividend and value stocks and capitalization and bonds and debt. And I thought I'd prepare myself as best I could for the interview. Mm -hmm. And I met Mr. Larkin, a big, tall, Irish, good looking gentleman dressed in a suit. And I'm in a suit. And I sit across from the desk and he said to me, so tell me, why would you like to be a broker? And I thought, wow. I hadn't anticipated that question. And I said to him, well, the truth is I'd like to make a lot of money. And he pointed at me and he said, that's the right answer. I'm going to mm. give you a job. So fortunately for me, you know, Mr. Larkin and Mr. Titus hired me and the rest has been my 60 year history. Wow. That's an awesome story. Yeah. Um, can you tell us what, you know, what the industry was like when you first started out, because it, it's, it was very different than it is now, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It, it was. I mean, it was a time of fixed commissions, mm -hmm. so and commissions were rather high. There were no fee-based businesses. Uh, mutual funds were charging a load, so most funds were charging either five or six percent to buy in, and. Um, you just had to build a business based on people participating in trades because if they didn't trade, you didn't make money or you had to continually find people with new money. And I remember as a youngster, I thought, well, I'm going to find out how some of these people with the low roads and company, I, I was hired by low roads and company were uh, attributing their success to, so for my first two weeks or so in the business, I visited the branch offices up in places like Syracuse and Schenectady and different places around the Finger Lakes uh, and talked to the brokers. At that time, most of the offices were one man office with a secretary mm -hmm. and they were people who had left New York to sort of semi-retire and John Loeb had always convinced them to have a little storefront office. And so they all gave me their opinion about how you approach your business. And basically, they all said the same thing. Do what's right for the client. Don't think about yourself. Don't think about the commissions. And eventually, everything will fall in place. And think longer term rather than shorter term. Mm. So, uh, And that was obviously good advice. And back then, we also we lived and died by the sword because we didn't build portfolios the way we do today. 
I mean, in 1962, 63, if someone walked in with two, three, four, five thousand dollars, that was a decent account. And mm-hmm. you didn't you didn't have the the luxury of buying them, you know, a portfolio of stocks. You generally had to buy one or two names. So you were either a hero or a goat, depending mm-hmm. on what, what you purchased, you know. So that's been, I think, the biggest change. Today we build portfolios, we focus on risk levels, we want to have bonds and stocks, and we give, I think, more advice than just trying to pick something that might go up in value. Yeah, I just I I love hearing about the history of this industry. Um I mean so our publication goes back to the 1970s actually. It's the um the old registered rep magazine if you uh, Oh sure. If, I if remember you know that name. Yeah. yeah. Or it used to be registered representative and then we shortened it and yeah. Um, yeah. you know, evolved over the years. But so I know, you know, you did very well for yourself in the industry. Um, you know, you got married, uh, you had four kids, and uh in 1979 you were sort of struck by tragedy. Um, tell us what happened. So I married in 1969, and I married a woman who had uh, a son who at the time was uh eight years old. Mm. And then we adopted three children. Mm. Uh, And 10 years later, in 1979, tragically, she was killed in an automobile accident. Excuse Mm. me. And I was left with a five-year-old, seven-year-old, nine-year-old, and 18-year-old. And uh, needless to say, it was a a very sad time in my life and a tragic time because I was greatly in love and very happy. Um, mm. I, I, I actually used to pinch myself thinking, wow, how lucky I am to have these children and my wife and a beautiful home and a nice business and a great family and friends and relatives. Uh, and up comes this tragedy. It was, it was a sad time. And I think thanks for the fact that uh, I had my business to go to it distracted me from a lot of the pain of the everyday loss of my my life so mm. work helped to uh, to support me through that difficult time and my family obviously my brother my mother my aunts and uncles uh they were all there for me mm. and uh i think that that helps anybody get through a tough time there's not a lot people can do for you but you know if you understand that they're there trying to do whatever they can, if they're needed, really makes the difference. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've talked to people on the on the podcast who have gone through, um, you know, tragedies themselves. And, um, you know, a lot of folks are, they're the ones that are usually helping other people, right? Um, yeah. Like, you know, you're the one, you know, helping your family and helping your um your your clients but you you know during those times you need uh you need support you need help yeah um you and, be hard and, to ask for that but yeah and knowing yeah. that they're there because there's not a lot they can really do i mean you know um most of it falls on you to take care of your children and take care of your home and i had a business not only in wall street but i also owned a couple of cable tv franchises so I was juggling that outside business, the Wall Street business, my children, uh, the household, etc. And we lived in an area where it wasn't easy to find people to help you, you know, do the things you'd like to do, like a nanny, you know, mm. or someone to go shopping or clean the house and things. So all of that was a little more difficult because of where we were located. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about the years following that and um, what happened. So that was 1979. And, um, you know, my children started to grow and I saw to it that they were in camps in the summertime and, you know, going to swim camps during the winter time and, uh, and when my wife passed away, there was an insurance policy, mm-hmm. and I put the money aside, didn't know what to do with it. And then 
perhaps 10 years later, maybe a little earlier than that, it dawned on me that she loved working with children with disabilities. She would teach them how to swim. Mm -hmm. um, and that was her passion. And, well, she taught them more than just swimming, but she was involved with children with pretty severe disabilities. Mm. And so I decided, well, this would be a good good uh, thing to start in her memory, a foundation that would focus on helping children with disabilities. And we did in about 1989, 1990, we started uh, our uh, Inga Biondo uh, Foundation. And mm -hmm. today we send between 100 and 200 children to summer camp, all disabled children, to summer camp every year. Mm. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, what it, I mean, tell us about your, your passion for, for giving back to the community and, um, you know, how has that sort of contributed to just your overall well being? How has it helped you to just live a more full life? And I don't well, know. you know, I, I think, I mean, I learned it from my mom. My mom didn't have much, but, you know, she would give a dollar here or 50 cents there or five dollars. And uh, she was always grateful that she was healthy and her children were healthy. Uh, and and she tried to help others and her brothers and sisters and some friends. And I think I just learned that being grateful is, is part of life if you've been lucky. And I think I've been very fortunate to be healthy to have children that are healthy, to have a wife that's healthy, to have grandchildren that are healthy. And I think uh, it's made me want to give back because I'm grateful. And so uh, it's been part of my life. And I think it makes you really feel good if you do something to help people that are less fortunate. So it doesn't matter what your interest really is in terms of helping others. But I think if you can find something that makes you feel good because you've done something for someone else in need, that that satisfaction, I don't think can be really even described. It's just a, a, a wonderful feeling to know that you've done something to help somebody live a little better life. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just helped a young man in Africa along with a couple of friends go through school. He was an orphan and then he went through college and then he went through medical school. And I just got a note from him about how grateful he is that he was chosen to participate in this program as a youngster and what it's led to today. And he talked about his obligation to give back because someone gave to him. So I think that's what it's all about, that if you, you get that message across and others feel, wow, someone helped me and I'm going to help someone else, that uh, you make the world a little better place. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so tell me a little bit about where, where, what led you to where you are now. Um, you know, I know that you, um, you know, you got remarried after uh, your your wife passed away, and and um, you know, you, your wife, you're with your wife, wife Ronnie now, and and between the two of you, you have fourteen children. Um, I think they're all grown now, right? Yeah, for the most part. Yeah, the youngest is in his mid thirties. I think he's thirty five. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, just you know, tell me a little about where you are now, and and how you got to where you are. Well, you know, we uh, we talked a little bit about my tragedy, losing my wife. Ronnie lost two of her children. Uh, mm -hmm. We got married in uh, 1996. And mm -hmm. in 2009, she lost a son. And in 2014, she lost a second son. So, uh, oh, need, yeah, needless to say, it was a tragic time in her life. And she had to find the strength to get through it. And, I, you know, I don't think you ever really get through it. I think it just becomes maybe a little smaller part of your life as time goes on. And every so often, uh, the full pain of a loss comes back. I, I experience it. I mean, I lost my wife in 1979. 
And every so often, I'll just have something happen in my life that'll bring sadness and tears to mm. my life that day. And then I seem to go on and, you know, it may not happen for a long, long time again, but it it continually happens. So she's been very strong and uh, uh, she's had a lot of support from her other children uh, to help through that all, you know. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess, some, you know, something reminds you of the person or something that they liked. I think that that happens to everybody who's, who's lost a loved one. So, you know, obviously you've you've had a, 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 you know, long career. What were some of the struggles that you experienced over the years as a financial advisor? So I think that I think the toughest thing that happens to you is, as I said before, we were buying one or two stocks. And if you happen to be fortunate enough to have picked some winners, uh, life is not that difficult. But in a small town, and we were in a small town, I mean, our office today, our corporate headquarters today is in a town of 950 people. And the business was built in Port Jervis, New York, which is a town at the end of Appalachia with about 8,000 people with a median income of about $39,000. So it's quite remarkable that we were able to build a business in that environment. But I, I think, you know, the the struggles you had is when you had a stock that went down and I can recall a couple of them. And for a period of, you know, six months to maybe a year, you were just devastated because so many people that now have become friends, not only clients, had mm. lost money. And, you know, I felt the pain because not only did they lose money, I was losing my own money. So it was painful for me and it was painful for me to watch them lose their money and thinking, you know, how do we start back again? How do we get up and, you know, take another swing at the at the plate and try and make money back? Uh, so I think that was very difficult that, uh, you know, you were either a hero or a goat. And when you were a goat, you went through six or 12 months of a lot of pain. Uh, mm -hmm. You felt it for yourself and for your business and for the, and mostly for the clients. I mean, you know, I, I have always had a lot of clients that are friends. And so I've had that, uh, that empathy, you know, and sensitivity about them either being successful or not. And it was painful when, when I wasn't making them money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do in those situations? I mean, because, uh, you know, a lot of advisors may be going through that now, you know, with the markets, uh, you know, uh, you know, you have to, I, I think you were telling me that you really have to, you know, just show up and be, make sure that, that, you know, that they know that you are there to help them through that time. And, and, you know, you're not just out playing golf, right? Well, I, I, th I listen, I, I've said this to my son and all of our employees. When things are good and people are making money and the market's going up, truthfully, no one cares if you're on the golf course or in the office or down on the beach. Mm. But when things are bad and they see their dollar go down to 90 cents or 80 cents or 70 cents, you better be there and you better reach out and let them know that, A, you're aware of what's going on. B, you're sensitive to the fact that even though it may be profits that they've given back, they still feel that they've lost money. And in fact, their dollar is now worth 80 cents. So they have. And I think you have to stress all along when you deal with them from day one on that you're trustworthy, that you're honest, that you have integrity and that you're looking at the long term and not, you know, the day-to-day -day fluctuations. But I think it's in the tough times that we all earn our money. And the worst thing you could do is not reach out to the clients and let them know how you feel about things. Because, you know, when a market's like the current market and everything's going down, that's a, an easier environment than if you have a portfolio and there's a couple of stocks going down and the market's not going down. Right. I mean, that, yeah. that's a time you have to reach out and say, listen, we, we've made a mistake here. 
or we think it's down because, and we don't want to sell it because we think, you know, this and this is going to happen. And so I think one of the lessons we've learned is that when you buy into a company, you've got to buy in with expectations. And if those expectations do not play out, that you have to start to take action to move on to another investment. So I, I, mm. that's probably the best advice I could give a young broker is to, you know, look for companies that have strong management and innovative products and recurring revenues and pricing power and small debt and management that you that you respect and you respect their intelligence and their judgment because they're all going to make a mistake and they're all going to have problems. But the distinguishing factor between the winners and losers is how they handle those problems when they arise. Mm. And and I think that that allows you to stay the course if you believe in the management. And if they don't fulfill on your expectations, then I think it's time that you you look for something else to invest the money in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's great. Um, I know that you um, are still active, you know, very active in the business, um, going to work um, almost every day. Um, what keeps you active in the business? And do you have any plans to to slow down or scale back? I don't think so uh, about slowing down and scaling back. Uh, John and Henry Loeb, who were the people that first hired me as a youngster, they worked until their mid-90s. Wow. And I, I, yeah, and I think the the beauty of that is that a it gives me a purpose to get up every day. B it keeps me informed about current events and politics and business and international affairs, because if you're not up on those things, you can't do a good job and talk to your clients intelligently. And I get a great deal of satisfaction out of seeing somebody who walks in the door with a dollar. And over time, I can convert that to $2. I mean, to me, that's probably the most joy that I get in the business is seeing that we've changed the lives of people because we've made the money. And over the, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, I've seen people that have walked in with the equivalent of a dollar and who have taken out three or four dollars and still have five or six dollars left in the account. So the performances, I mean, you, you know, when Warren Buffett talks about it all the time, when you start compounding money at eight or 10 or 12 percent a year, the results are phenomenal when you start to look at 10 or 20 years. Mm. Well, I mean, I just feel like I could listen to you all day and, you know, you're you're um, you just have such great wisdom and, and advice for us. Um, but I'm afraid we're just, just about out of time. But I'd like to thank my guest, Joseph R. Biondo, for, for being on the podcast and, and just opening up here about his experiences. Joe, thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me, Dan. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's just been fascinating. Um, if you'd like to reach out to Joe, uh, to Joe personally, you can reach him at jrbiondo at thebiondogroup.com. And if you yourself have a struggle, uh, you wish to share your experiences and help others in similar situations, please feel free to reach out to me at diana.britton at informa.com. I'd like to thank you for listening to The Healthy Advisor. If you'd not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This is Diana Britton reminding you that where there's healing, there is hope. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The Healthy Advisor, a podcast focused on advisors' personal well-being and healing. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of wealthmanagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your particular situation.